Welcome to another episode of Christopher Wynne's I Never Knew That, opening a door onto a world of knowledge, adventure and surprise as we travel around Britain and Ireland in search of entertaining stories and fascinating facts that will make you want to exclaim again and again, I never knew that. I'm Christopher Wynne, author of the I Never Knew That book series about the countries and peoples of Britain and Ireland, and I will be your guide as we travel around the regions of England, Scotland, Wales and Ireland, meeting friends along the way and learning about the people and places that make these beautiful islands the most magical place on earth. In this episode, we explore England's South Midlands, taking in the birthplace of English song in Berkshire, Heaven on Earth in Oxfordshire, a country churchyard in Buckinghamshire, where we have all the time in the world, the launch site in Middlesex for the first balloon flight over England, and the exact spot in Hertfordshire, where a young man made a momentous decision that changed the world for good. Stop 1. Reading Abbey, Berkshire That Reading has an abbey comes as quite a surprise, but the town of Reading, county town of Berkshire, since 1867, is older than it looks. Viewed from the train, which is how many people see it, Reading is just office blocks, roundabouts and factories, an industrial town, famously built on brewing, bulbs and biscuits. The biscuits being Huntley and Palmer's, founded by Joseph Huntley in a small shop in Reading in 1822. Huntley's cousin George Palmer joined 20 years later, and Huntley and Palmer's grew to be the biggest and the most famous biscuit company in the world. From its Reading factory, the biggest biscuit factory in the world, They sent biscuits to every corner of the globe, to China and Japan, to the Antarctic with Captain Scott, and even to the Forbidden Kingdom of Tibet. When Sir Francis' young husband became the first European to enter Tibet, he was offered a selection of Huntley and Palmer's biscuits as a welcome gift. Joseph Huntley also invented that Christmas staple, the biscuit tin. But Reading was important long before biscuits. Set up on a gravel spur between two rivers, the Kennet and the Thames, at an important junction for travellers journeying both north-south and east-west, Reading became a major settlement under the Saxons and was constantly fought over during the wars between the Saxons and the Vikings in the 9th and 10th centuries. In 1121, The year after his son William was drowned off Normandy in the White Ship tragedy, Henry I founded an abbey at Reading. For the salvation of my soul. The abbey was still being built when Henry died in France in 1136 of a surfeit of lampreys, or in modern parlance from eating too much fish. And he was brought back to Reading Abbey and buried beneath the high altar allegedly in a silver coffin. Reading Abbey was finally opened in 1164 by the Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Becket, in the presence of Henry I's grandson, Henry II, and it grew to be one of the richest abbeys in Europe, with the fourth largest church in the whole of Britain. King John and Henry III held parliaments there, And in 1359, Edward III's son, John of Gaunt, was married at Reading to Blanche, the daughter of Henry, Duke of Lancaster, thus founding the Royal House of Lancaster. 
there followed 14 days of celebration. Passing through Reading on the train, or even driving through, as I once tried to do, never again, you would have no idea that Reading Abbey even existed, let alone was so significant in English history. But in the last ten years, in the run-up to the Abbey's 900th anniversary in 2021, great efforts have been made to open up the Abbey ruins for visitors, and although the remains are still somewhat hidden amongst office blocks, Reading Abbey is a fascinating place to visit. A short walk from the station, through Forbury Gardens past the Forbury Lion, the biggest lion in the world, sculpted as a memorial to the soldiers of the Royal Berkshire Regiment killed in the Afghan Wars, brings you to the 13th century Abbey Gateway, where Jane Austen studied when it was the home of Reading Ladies' Boarding School. Then it's a two-minute wiggle through the office blocks to the main ruins, which are impressive and give some indication of the huge scale of the original abbey. A marker shows the site of Henry I's burial place beneath the high altar. And on a wall of the chapter house is a memorial plaque showing the music and words to a madrigal called Summer is a-Comin, the first known song in the English language, which was written by a monk at the Abbey in the mid-13th century. The catchy song is actually more famous than the Abbey and has been sung around the world, including at the opening ceremony of the 1972 Summer Olympics in Munich, and in the 1973 cult horror film The Wicker Man. Incidentally, the lyrics of the song, which is also known as the Cuckoo Song, include the first recorded use of that fine Old English word, fart. Looming over the Abbey ruins is the infamous Reading Jail, designed in 1844 by Sir George Gilbert Scott as a typically grim Victorian institution. This is where Oscar Wilde was imprisoned from 1895 to 1897. As he later wrote in the Ballad of Reading Jail, In Reading Jail by Reading Town there is a pit of shame. And in it lies a wretched man eaten by teeth of flame. In burning winding sheet he lies, and his grave has got no name. The man had killed the thing he loved, and so he had to die. And all men kill the thing they love. Indeed. Stop 2. Kelmscott, Oxfordshire. Kelmscott. A little village about two miles above Radcote Bridge. A heaven on earth, an old stone Elizabethan house, and such a garden. Close down on the river, a boathouse, and all things handy. So wrote designer, socialist, and father of the arts and crafts movement, William Morris, after he came across the Thameside village of Kelmscott, and its mellow, 16th-century Cotswold Stone Manor House, while looking for a country retreat where he and his wife and children could escape from their busy life in London. With them in the search 
was friend and pre-Raphaelite artist Dante Gabriel Rossetti, and together Rossetti and Morris took out a lease on Kelmscott Manor in 1871. For the first four or five years, Morris was unable to really enjoy life at Kelmscott because Rossetti was obsessed with Morris's wife Jane, painting numerous pictures of her and writing her endless love poems. Morris decided to let them get on with it, in the hope that Rossetti would tire of the affair, which in the end he did, for Rossetti was a metropolitan by nature, hated the damp cold of the old house, disliked the village, which he described as the doziest clump of old beehives, and found country life dull and monotonous. Kelmscott, it turned out, didn't like Rossetti very much either. Addicted to laudanum, he insulted the villagers and swore at fishermen as they walked past the house on the way to the river. Eventually he was more or less forced to leave and Morris was able to enjoy Kelmscott and his wife in peace. Thereafter, William Morris was at his happiest at Kelmscott. He loved the way the manor looked so natural in its setting, as though it had grown up out of the soil. And Kelmscott, more than any other place, shaped his belief that buildings embodied the past and were imbued with the spirits of those who had lived there before. Morris enjoyed the views from the house, writing... Through its south window you catch a glimpse of the Thames, Clover Meadows and the pretty little elm-crowned hill over in Berkshire. And his designs were taken from the natural world he saw around him there. One of his most popular designs, Willow Bough, was inspired by the willow trees growing down by the river at the bottom of the garden. The Morris family were amongst the first people to use the Thames for messing about on the river, purely for pleasure. And on one famous occasion, they travelled up the Thames from their London home at Hammersmith in a large punt, which Morris called a houseboat, but which his daughter May described as a sort of insane gondola. On one trip up river from Kelmscott, Morris came across a small, badly neglected Saxon church at Inglesham in Wiltshire, which was so full of original furnishings and features from every era of the last 1,000 years that it inspired him to set up the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings, SPAB, with the aim of protecting old buildings from insensitive modernisation or restoration. SPAB led indirectly to the National Trust. William Morris died in London in 1896 and his body was brought to Lechlade by train and then carried to the church at Kelmscott on a simple red and yellow farm wagon covered in bulrushes, flowers and willow. He was buried in the churchyard in a long roofed tomb designed by his friend the architect Philip Webb. His wife Jane and their daughters Jenny and May were all buried alongside him in their time. Kelmscott Manor is now owned by the Society of Antiquaries and is open to the public at certain times in the summer months. It has been kept as near as possible to how it was when the Morrises lived there and is furnished throughout with original Morris furniture, decorations and paintings. The garden is also laid out as Morris had it and is still subject to frequent flooding as it was in Morris's day when the whole family would row across the lawn in a boat straight onto the river. And a visit to this hidden and timeless heaven on earth is a real joy.
Stop 3. Stoke Pogis, Buckinghamshire. The curfew tolls the knell of parting day. The lowing herd winds slowly o'er the lea. The ploughman homeward plods his weary way and leaves the world to darkness and to me. These words are from the first verse of one of the most enduring and best-loved English poems of all time, Elegy Written in a Country Churchyard, composed by Thomas Gray and published in 1751. The poem seems to perfectly capture the popular view of an idyllic, sleepy, rural England before the Industrial Revolution, and has given the English language a number of phrases, such as far from the madding crowd and kindred spirit, as well as sparking a heated debate amongst literary scholars on going to this day, should it be the lowing herd wind slowly o'er the lee, or the lowing herd winds with an S slowly o'er the lee. The country churchyard in question is that of St Giles in Stoke Poges, a village north of Slough. And the churchyard, too, reminds us of how England must once have been. It lies some way from the village, quiet and charming and embowered in trees. The yew tree, in the shade of which Gray sat, sucking his quill while composing his elegy, is still there, and Gray himself is buried alongside his mother in a rough brick tomb outside the east end of the church. On the north side of the church, an unusual oak-panelled cloister leads to a private vestibule belonging to next-door Stoke Poges Manor, a fine red-brick Tudor house that has been home to many famous personages, but most notably to Thomas Penn, son of William Penn, founder of the American state of Pennsylvania, and later Thomas's son John. In 1788, John Penn, flush with money from selling Pennsylvania to the new US government, commissioned the architect James Wyatt to build a brand new mansion, Stoke Park, to the west of the manor house, and hired Capability Brown and Humphrey Repton to landscape the surrounding 300 acres of parkland. You can see the grand Georgian mansion that Wyatt came up with from the churchyard. A subsequent owner, Lord Taunton, created a deer park at Stoke and often invited his friend, the artist, Edwin Landseer, to come and stay. And it was while at Stoke Park that Landseer painted his most famous work, Monarch of the Glen, using as a model one of the Stoke Park deer. In 1908, Stoke Park was bought by Nick Lane Jackson, founder of the Corinthians Football Club famous everywhere for promoting fair play and sportsmanship, and credited with popularising football around the world. Jackson brought in the golf course designer, Harry Colt, renowned for such courses as Wentworth, Sunningdale, Muirfield and Royal Port Rush, to lay out a golf course in the park, and he thus turned Stoke Park into Britain's first country club. Stoke Park gained true world recognition when it became the setting for the most famous game of golf in cinematic history, between James Bond, played by Sean Connery, and Auric Goldfinger, played by Gert Frobe. After the match, Goldfinger warns Bond off from interfering in his affairs by ordering his mute Korean manservant Oddjob to decapitate one of the statues decorating the gardens with his iron-tipped bowler hat. Remarkable, exclaims Bond, 
But what does the club secretary have to say? Or nothing, Mr. Bond, replies Goldfinger. I own the club. And just to complete the link between 007, Thomas Gray and Stoke Poges, James Bond's wife, Teresa, or Tracy, who was killed by Blofeld at the end of On Her Majesty's Secret Service, is buried in the churchyard where Thomas Gray wrote his elegy. At the beginning of the Bond movie, For Your Eyes Only, we see Bond, now in the guise of Roger Moore, visiting the churchyard to place roses on Teresa's grave before being whisked off in a helicopter. As it says on Tracy's gravestone, and as one can't help but feel while wandering through that peaceful churchyard, waiting for the ploughman to homeward plod his weary way, we have all the time in the world. Stop 4. The Artillery Ground, Finsbury, Middlesex. Hidden away behind office blocks in Finsbury, just outside the northern boundary of the City of London, is one of the great playing fields of England, the Artillery Ground. Originally an open space set aside for archery practice, in 1638 the ground was given to the Honourable Artillery Company, founded by King Henry VIII in 1537, for the better increase of the defence of this our realm and maintenance of the science and feat of shooting longbows, crossbows and handguns. The HAC, as it is now known, is the oldest regiment in the British Army and the second oldest surviving military corps in the world, after the Swiss Pontifical Guard. In the 18th century, the artillery ground became a venue for cricket. With one of the earliest recorded cricket matches being played there in 1730, between London and Surrey. At subsequent matches, the playing area was roped off and an entrance fee charged, cricket thus becoming the first sport to enclose its pitches and to charge an entrance fee. In May 1731, what was perhaps the first ever cricketing fatality occurred outside the artillery ground, when a Mr Leggett, who had the misfortune to be passing by on the road, was struck on the nose by a ball hit out of the ground. He began bleeding copiously, and died from loss of blood shortly afterwards. On 15th of September 1784, the artillery ground became England's first public launch ground, when Vincenzo Lunardi, secretary to His Excellency the Neapolitan Ambassador to the Court of St James's, Buongiorno, took off from the ground in front of a huge crowd at the start of the first ever balloon flight over England. In the balloon with Lunardi were his dog, his cat, a pigeon, some cold chicken and a bottle of white wine. Mm, delicioso. Also on board, crucially, were a pair of oars with which he intended to row the balloon through the air. The oars seemed like quite a good idea at the time, but as it turned out, weren't really necessary. The first balloon flight over England lasted a little over two hours and covered 30 miles, ending in Hertfordshire at Standon End Green, a well-mannered hamlet just north of Ware. A plaque marks the spot where the balloon landed, exhorting posterity to 
No and be astonished that on the 15th day of September 1784, Vincent Lunardi of Lucca in Tuscany, the first aerial traveller in Britain, traversing the regions of the air for two hours and 15 minutes on this spot, revisited the Earth. Of the balloon's original manifest, only Lunardi and the dog made it all the way. The pigeon flew off somewhere over Hampstead. The cold chicken and white wine were consumed over Edgware, and at North Mims, noticing that the cat was shivering, Lunardi descended, and while hovering just off the ground, handed the feline to a dumbstruck passing gentlewoman. Pa favore. Prenditi cura del mio ghetto? Before doffing his hat, grazie cara signora, and wafting back up into the heavens. Arrivederci. Lunardi went on to complete many more balloon flights none of them without incident, most notably the embarrassing occasion in Liverpool when he got entangled in a rope and was lifted into the sky dangling upside down below the basket. Oh, maledizione! He completed some two and a half miles in this undignified position before being deposited, dizzy but unharmed, on the side of an obliging hill. Miraculously, Lunardi died naturally in his bed in Genoa in 1806, completely broke but immortalised as the first man ever to successfully pilot a balloon over Britain. Molto ben fatto. Stop 5. Wade's Mill, Hertfordshire. Beside the old A10, on a gentle rise outside the lovely village of Wade's Mill, there is a small stone obelisk standing on a pedestal that marks a pivotal moment in the history of the world. Inscribed on the pedestal are the following words. On the spot where stands this monument, in the month of June 1785, Thomas Clarkson resolved to devote his life to bringing about the abolition of the slave trade. Thomas Clarkson was born in Wisbeach in Cambridgeshire in 1760, the son of a schoolteacher and curate. He originally intended to follow his father into the church, but while at Cambridge University began researching the slave trade for an essay competition on the subject of whether it was lawful to make slaves of others against their will. Clarkson won the competition and in 1785, on his way back to London from Cambridge, where he had been invited to read his essay in the Senate House, he stopped at Wade's Mill for a rest and, in his own words, sat down disconsolate on the turf by the roadside and held my horse. Here a thought came into my mind, that if the contents of the essay were true, it was time some person should see these calamities to their end. Now most of us would like to do something in our lives to make the world a better place. Thomas Clarkson actually did. Aged just 25, he set out from Wade's Mill to abolish the slave trade across the world. His essay had brought him to the attention of others sympathetic to the cause, and in 1787 he and a small group of fellow abolitionists, such as Granville Sharp and Josiah Wedgwood, set up the Committee for the Abolition of the Slave Trade, while the MP William Wilberforce agreed to be their representative in Parliament. (laughs) 
Clarkson was tasked with gathering evidence of the appalling nature of the slave trade to put before Parliament, and to this end he travelled around the country talking to those involved, merchants, slave captains, sailors and doctors who had worked on slave transports. In Bristol, he learned much from the sympathetic landlord of the Seven Stars pub, which still stands down by the docks today. In Liverpool, he just escaped a gang of men sent to kill him, for the slave trade was a lucrative business and he was making powerful enemies. In London and Plymouth, he was jostled and threatened and jeered at, but he never wavered. Clarkson quickly discovered that visual aids were the most potent way of garnering support. And not only did he gather up examples of the gruesome equipment used aboard slave ships, like handcuffs, leg shackles, branding irons and thumb screws, he also collected together examples of beautiful artefacts made in Africa, such as carved ivory and textiles, to illustrate the craftsmanship and skill of those who were being enslaved. The fight was long and hard, and there were many setbacks, but Clarkson persevered, and his determination eventually forced people to look at themselves and admit the obvious justice of his cause. In 1807, the Slave Trade Act was passed, prohibiting the slave trade in large parts of the British Empire, and establishing the Royal Navy's West Africa Squadron to suppress the Atlantic slave trade, an act that was expanded to include the whole empire with the Slavery Abolition Act of 1833. Although Clarkson did not live to see the complete eradication of slavery, there is no doubt that he did more than anyone else to bring about its abolition. And it seems almost surreal that such a significant moment in history, when a young man of 25 made a bold, far-reaching decision to change the world for good, that it should have occurred in such a quiet and unassuming part of the English countryside as Wade's Mill in Hertfordshire. And to sit where Clarkson himself actually sat when he determined to rid the world of slavery is a truly humbling experience. Well, that concludes our tour of the South Midlands. In the next episode, we visit the East Midlands, taking in a quiet corner in Bedfordshire, where the celestial light shone most brightly. The oldest house in England in Huntingdonshire. The room in Rutland, where the gunpowder plot may have been hatched. The burial place in Leicestershire of the last Plantagenet king and George Washington's ancestral home in Northamptonshire. This has been an I Never Knew That production, brought to you by Christopher Wynne and guest star Rupert Van Sittert. Find out more at ChristopherWynne'sIneverKnewThat.com and check out the I Never Knew That books, available online and at all good bookshops. Thanks for listening. If you have enjoyed this podcast, please rate and review, and join me again next time to discover more tales that will make you want to exclaim again and again, I never knew that.